The Sham Moon malware, which is also known as W32.distrack, was actually discovered in August, in August of 2012, and actually was seen to be targeting uh, specific companies in the energy sector. And one particular company that uh, was targeted by Sham Moon is a company known as uh, Saudi Aramco, uh, and they actually reported that about 30,000, 30,000 of their PCs. Uh, were infected with this particular threat. And it was actually a highly destructive threat. It was a threat that was designed to delete data from systems. Now, when, when this piece of malware was first discovered, or when the, the underlying piece of malware associated with the Shamoon attack was discovered, uh, there was a string in that malware, and that string uh, pointed to a file. The string was a C colon backslash Shamoon backslash Arabian Gulf backslash wiper backslash release backslash wiper dot PBD. And so already you can see that uh, the term Shamoon is in this particular string, and that's actually the reason why uh, the existing anti-malware vendors decided to name the threat Shamoon. They just saw the name Shamoon in the file itself. But what was particularly interesting about the string is that it contained this term wiper in it. And when um, secure researchers saw the term wiper together with the, the fact that Shamoon was designed to delete threats from systems, to wipe systems clean, uh, that became reminiscent of another attack uh, that was also called Wiper, and this particular Wiper uh, was associated with a really famous piece of malware known as Flame. And Flame itself was a uh, a piece of malware that was believed to, to have been developed by a nation state. Uh, and actually, I did a separate series of videos on Flame, so I won't belabor the point about Flame. You can check those videos out. Uh, but I think uh, given the relationship between this Wiper and this Flame and the fact that this new threat, Shamoon threat, had some relation to Wiper. That certainly piqued people's interests. But I think that the similarity here was as either maybe coincidental or perhaps the similarities is put in here as a bit of a red herring. Uh, because aside from this, this basic, very superficial similarity, uh, there are enough differences between uh, Shamoon and the, the Wiper threat associated with Flame uh, to suggest that they are not developed by the same team. I mean, the code is different underneath uh, and uh, if anything, Shamoon is not nearly as sophisticated as Flame was, and so it does not seem to have been a nation-state-sponsored piece of malware. It's not like a Flame or a Stuxnet or a Gauss or a Dooku or something along those lines. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that um, I suspect that the people who created Shamoon uh, were part of uh, a hacktivist group. Okay, They were politically motivated uh, rather than perhaps financially motivated uh, in their efforts, and, and there are a few reasons for that. Uh, but certainly one of the reasons for that is that even though uh, this group possessed a certain level of technical sophistication, they were not nearly at the same level uh, in terms of, of ability and funding as, let's say, a nation-state piece of malware like, like a Stuxnet or a, a Flame. Uh, probably they were, they were somehow inspired by Wiper, uh, and maybe they decided to create a copycat attack uh, based on that initial inspiration. All right, so you can actually take a threat like Shamoon and you can break it up into its different components and talk about some of its different activities, and I'll do that right here. Uh, so one of the first things that Shamoon did is it actually would drop itself onto a system, and it was in this initial phase that it really initially infected the system, and there were a few things or a few aspects of how it was dropped onto a system that I think are worth uh, pointing out. Uh, so in the case of Shamoon, it appears to have been initially dropped into an environment uh, via a USB stick, okay, and, and really this was a USB stick that was planted there, it seems, by an insider uh, in the organization who basically caused the initial machine to get infected. Okay, and then once it was in the environment, once it initially infected that first system, that patient zero, uh, it basically spread through the environment uh, via network shares. And what's particularly interesting about Shamoon is that it appears like the authors of Shamoon had already had access to uh, and, and knew about domain credentials and also knew about, uh, had access to the domain controller itself. Okay, and that allowed them to cause the malware to spread uh, more rapidly and more easily. And again, it was another sign that the, the threat itself was being perpetrated by insiders as opposed to by some external entity. Okay, now once the system was actually infected with Shamu, the next thing that it did is it proceeded to wipe the system. It actually proceeded to delete files uh, from the system. And that wipe functionality was actually carried out within a specific order and with a specific structure in mind. Uh, for starters, 
uh, Shamoon looks for specific kinds of folders. For example, your, your documents and settings folder, uh, and also your config folder, and uh, the, the folder associated with the user, and so on and so forth. Also, it tried to delete uh, traces of itself to make itself harder to find. Okay, uh, and, and once it did that, once it overwrote those files, and, and actually I should point out that the way it overwrote those files was particularly intriguing. What Shamoon actually did is it overwrote the files with uh, binary content that coincided with the representation, a JPEG uh, representation of a burning flag, a burning US flag, actually. Uh, and that's kind of uh, a sign that uh, the malware was probably somehow politically motivated rather than being uh, financially motivated. All right. And then once this initial wipe was carried out, where the initial files were removed from the system, the next aspect of the wipe functionality was to delete what's known as the master boot record, or the MBR. Okay, and the master boot record in particular is, uh, if you don't already know, it's the first sector on the hard drive of a computer. And it basically tells the computer how the hard drive is partitioned and how to load the operating system, and so on and so forth. And so you can quickly imagine that without the master boot record, or if you destroy or compromised or corrupted the master boot record, the computer becomes largely inoperable. All right. Now, one unique thing about Shamoon, or maybe not that unique thing about Shamoon, is that uh, in this process of modifying or changing or deleting the master boot record, Shamoon actually leveraged a piece of commercial software that's known as Raw Disk. And Raw Disk is actually software created by a company known as uh, LDOS. And really, this, 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 this commercial software that can be used to delete a master boot record, and, and there are legitimate reasons for why somebody might want to wipe the master boot record on a system. And so you can imagine that there may be commercial technologies available for doing that. But I think it's also a sign, the fact that the authors used this existing commercial tool is a sign that they may not have had the level of sophistication to write a tool like this themselves. And that again points to the idea that this was more of a hacktivist attack than let's say a nation state sponsored a piece of malware. Okay? And now once they actually go at, went ahead and deleted and, and wiped the system, the last phase that I want to point out of Shamoon was the reporting phase. And this is the phase where the results of the previous operations are reported uh, back up to a central server somewhere uh, for record keeping purposes. And one point I want to make in terms of the, the reporting functionality that was again unique to this particular threat is that the the Shamoon server to which the reporting was done, that server was actually located internally on the same network as the underlying threat was deployed. Okay. Now, normally, what you would typically see in a botnet attack, let's say, is typically a botnet when there's a command and control server to which the, the bot infected hosts report, that command and control server is typically hosted externally uh, and is accessed externally, uh, and then the machines on the network, on the internal network, will contact that external host. In this particular case, the internal server, uh, the, the server for doing command and control was actually hosted internally as opposed to externally. And again, that is unique. Uh, it, it doesn't happen often, I'll put it that way. It does happen sometimes, but it's not the common case that you, that you typically see. And again, that adds more uh, credence, it adds more weight to the argument that the Shamoon threat itself was perpetrated by insiders in the organization because the server that was being used was an internal server and something that might have been easily accessible by an insider, but perhaps not so easily accessible by somebody on the outside. So the threat itself was really destructive. It deleted a lot of data in its path. And nowadays, we don't see a lot of threats that are, that are so noisy. The reality is that most threats today operate rather stealthily with the intent of perhaps um, exfiltrating data on a system or performing reconnaissance for as long as possible without going noticed, okay? And I guess the last thing I want to point out about Shamoon is that it is particularly worrisome because it wasn't difficult to carry out. It wasn't that sophisticated of a threat in the grand scheme of things. It targeted a large organization and it did a significant, a significant amount of damage along the way.